roadmap is very, very clear to me, and it's defined, and we'll come back to Brexit in a second, Martin, but it's defined by three big factors. One is demographics, the demographics in Northern Ireland, and uh, not the demographics as exist now, Martina, but the demographics as exist in the kids who are 10 years old in Northern Ireland. Okay, that's the first thing. Okay. The second thing is the understanding that economically partition has been a total disaster for everyone in the northeast of the country. Everyone. Nationalists, unionists, whatever tribe you, 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 you decide that to hang your, your, your colours on. It's been a, an economic disaster. Why would you say that? Not everybody would agree with that. You know, well, the, well, the evidence is overwhelming. In fact, it's overwhelming for all uh, centralised regions of the British, uh, the British state, Scotland, Wales, etc. Basically, what you've seen is the over centralization of the UK in London has led to the gradual erosion and then quite rapid erosion of the economic competences of the regions, whether it's Scotland, Wales, or Northern Ireland. Okay. In the partition, the North was a powerhouse. This is my point. It was this the agricultural republic was going to drag it down. Exactly. So this is my point. So at the, at the time of partition, so we take the late 19th century, early 20th century, that part of Ireland, the northeast of Ireland, was by far the wealthiest, by far the most innovative, by far the only industrial power. In fact, the southern economy we could describe as a beer and biscuits economy, that the only industry we had was the off products of agriculture, biscuits from Jacobs and beer from Guinnesses. There was no other industry here. So had you placed a bet a hundred years ago on the day of partition, your bet would have said the following, the Northern economy would continue to be a small microcosm of modernity. The Southern economy would languish as almost, as you said, an agricultural economy, but an economy that bled its people because of a lack of capital. And those people would have to emigrate. And that was the story from the famine on. And in fact, that was the story up until the 1970s. The Southern economy was backward, okay? But the interesting thing, the Southern economy turned around. Is so that joining the EU, the EEC? I think it's a combination of more than just the EU. I think it's a combination of many things. I think that what happened was, take the 1950s, we were, we were marking the passing of Jack Charlton there the other week, right? The football team that Jack Charlton created, think about who they were. They were the sons of Irish migrants who left in the 1950s, half a million Irish people left the island to live in England alone in the 1950s. So that's not about who went to Canada, who went to America, to England. My mother so there, was one of them. There you go. Your mother was one of them. And my parents were supposed to go to Canada. My, spirit, my parents had, had a ticket to Canada. My mom had a job in Canada. My dad was, they were thinking we we're going to, I would have ended up being a French speaker. They were going to go to Montreal. I, was, I, was, I would have ended up being a French Canadian, which is a bizarre uh, turn of events. But my sense is, the team that Jack Charlton built were the echoes of economic failure, okay, right? They were Irish people, Irish blood, but as Morrissey said, English hearts, okay? And they came and played for us, right? So that was our story. The North, think about the North, right? The North now is an economic backwater in comparison to the South, okay? On every single metric, not just on income, not just an in innovation, not just in startups, not just every single metric, okay? And the reason I believe is partition. And the, because partition robbed the North of its normal hinterland, first of all, number one. And number two, it created a dependency culture, which is very, very evident in the way in which Northern Ireland runs its economy. Uh, far it too much. It so, successful for the first decades of partition. It only. It, it was successful. successful. It was successful. It's quite interesting. Thing. Northern Ireland could pay for itself in the British Exchequer until the 1940s. Okay. Right? It actually had a surplus. So that's quite interesting. So there was a surplus of cash going from Northern Ireland to London up until the 1940s. Akin with the rest of the United Kingdom after the Second World War, you know, I, I don't know who it was, you know, Britain's an empire looking for a future or it's, it's, it's forgotten its empire, doesn't know its place. The Northern Irish economy has, like the rest of the British economy, 
absent London, the British economy is very backward. And I mean that you can engage that in a variety of ways in terms of trade, what it makes, what it doesn't make, etc. So Northern Ireland suffered profoundly by not having its own autonomy. That's the key. So what actually happens in economics is if you have a bond market, Martina, if you have to go out and raise money on your own, with your own flag, with your own risk premium as a country, you mature very quickly, okay? Because you have to get your house in order. Skin in the game. Precisely. So if you don't have that, if you're a dependent, if you're like a concubine economy, okay, right? You don't need to actually get up in the morning and say, what are we going to do today? Right? So consequently, politics and economics in the North has been diminished to simply a game of who can extract more money out of the exchequer. Right? Now, what that does is over two or three generations, in the first generation or two, that's fine, because it's an easy life. But what actually happens is the rest of the world is moving on, Martina. Nobody's waiting for Northern Ireland to wake up. And the same way in Britain. Nobody's waiting for Brexit. Nobody cares. I, I traveled before COVID a lot, giving you know, speeches. Brexit is very, very low on the rest of the world's list of priorities. It's kind of an, it's like an idiosyncratic, almost slightly British weirdness. You know, and I'm not talking about France and Germany. I'm talking about when you go to the English speaking world, you go to Canada, America, South Africa, Australia. It's like, yeah, get on with it, man. It's not our deal, right? So the world is not waiting for any country. Every country has to figure out how they play the game of competitive economics in a globalized world, okay? The Republic of Ireland, because we had our backs against the wall, because we had no capital, because nobody would lend money to us, we had to think, okay, what are we gonna do? How do we leapfrog this backwardness into the future? And what we did was A, join the European Union, and committedly, and I talk as somebody who worked as an economist in the Central Bank of Ireland. I had a few proper jobs years ago, Martina, before we started this, this, uh, this, 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 this other existence. But, you know, we'd go and we'd, I went to various, various meetings with the governor. We'd go and Ireland was, it was a commitment on the part of the civil servants that this was important to us. Now, I was very young. I was only the bag carrier. And it's because I'd gone to university uh, doing, doing a postgrad in Belgium that I could actually speak foreign languages, which was unusual in Ireland at the time in the early 90s. I, so I went along almost as like the, the government said, what are they saying? What are those Germans saying? What are those French saying? Anyway, the point was we were committed. But the main difference, I believe, was the presence of American multinationals, our openness to the United States, which was part of an economic strategy, Martina, but also part of a legacy of the diaspora. And I really believe this, that soft power is unbelievably important. It's very hard to put your finger on it, but I remember years ago working for a fellow called Jack Welch. Now, Jack Welch was the sort of legendary chief executive of GE, uh, kind of an arch hyper-capitalist, the guy who came up with, I think, pretty unpleasant ideas like shareholder value and how American corporations should only look at their shareholders. But that being said, Jack Welch's grandparents, with a name like Jack Welch, were from Cork. And I spent a lot of time with him because I was emceeing his European tour for his big order biography. So I'd sit with him in hotels after we did the gig and we'd chat. It was incredibly, uh, incredibly enriching experience for me to be so close to somebody who'd seen so much in the corporate world. Anyway, I asked him about investing in Ireland uh, when General Electric came to invest outside of the United States. And I said, did it matter that your grandparents were from Cork? And he was from Salem, Massachusetts, a very Irish area. And his dad was a bus driver in Salem, Massachusetts. And he looked at me almost aghast. And he said, of course it mattered. Of course it mattered. He said, the minute Ireland opened up, we Americans were ready to put our capital, not on the basis of legacy or heritage, but on the basis of a good economic decision. But softly in the back of our heads was this legacy connection. So I think those two things, the European Union and the Americans, this is what the British don't understand is that Ireland has been playing this game for a long time, which is, and all small countries have to figure this out. How do you play off the big countries? How do you be a part of the European Union, be attractive to Americans, and be cognizant of the fact that Britain is a significant trade partner? But I'll give you a statistic that shows a diversion of trade. When Winston Churchill was the Prime Minister of England 
Britain for the second time in the late 1940s, I think early 1950s. Early 1950s, you got a I think second. He kept dying by 51, didn't he? You got you? a second bite of the cherry, I think, right? right? Yeah. Uh, Irish trade to the Irish exports to Britain uh, were 92% of our exports, 93% of our exports went to the UK. Uh, today, it's 11%. So just think about the change in the economy. The Irish economy was hyper dependent on Britain in the 50s. In the Brexit year, epoch that they keep going back to, right? And they still think of the 1950s, right? Okay, as some sort of great uh, beer and warm beer and Empire. crickety. Yeah. All that carry on, right? All that, all that malarkey, and it's only malarkey, right? Nine out of 10 Irish exports went to Britain. Now one out of 10 Irish exports go to Britain, okay? So our economy has changed dramatically. So in a way, and this goes back to Northern Ireland, Britain has remained static. It hasn't dealt with the world as an economic entity. If you take London out of the equation, the financial markets, rock and roll, advertising, maybe the Premier League is another big British brand, right? If you take those out, what you're talking about is a country that has gone backward economically. And unfortunately, Northern Ireland, as an umbilical link to Britain, has been dragged back. So, for example, when I was a kid, Martina, you'll remember this, uh, I remember going to play a rugby match uh, for the school I was going to, secondary school, in Campbell College, and I'd never been in the North before, okay? And it was in the early 1980s, a little schoolboy team. And uh, we went across the border, and going across the border was like going into a modern country. The roads were better, the cars were better, the suites were better. I remember everything looked really different, okay? I was thinking, man, this is all cool. And I, I mean, of course, now, when my, when my, my in-laws uh, have a caravan, which is, I've noticed is a very northern thing to have, is a caravan, and they come down the south, and they come to Athlone all the time. They come down from Belfast, they come down, and they're always saying, you know, the roads are better, the cars are better, the standard of living is better. So what we've seen in our lifetime, Martina, is a shift in terms of lifestyle and living standards and whatever, right? And so my, my sense is that these, the opportunity for Northern Ireland in the context of a united island economy, okay, are enormous. If you think about income per head, for example, at the moment, the income per head in Northern Ireland is about 24,000 euros per year. Mm -hmm. And in the Republic, it's 40,000 euros a year. The facts, these are the facts on the ground, okay? The facts on the ground demand us to reconsider how this country operates. And as I said at the very start, looking out at the, let's say the, the, my daughter's 90th birthday, think about that, and her looking at her granddaughter, her granddaughter, if that happens, will be a citizen of the 23rd century. So we're very close, right? It's very, very close, right? And therefore, you look at the demographics, you look at the economics, you look at the wealth disparity. And when we were younger, Martina, do you remember this big thing with the North, the South can't afford the North? Remember that was the big thing? You still hear that today. You hear it, but it's probably not true. Tell me why. Because the Southern economy uh, is an economy of about 300 billion euros. The Northern economy is 50 billion, okay? So that's the disparity. Southern, the, Northern, the Southern economy is about six times greater. So it could absorb. So even if you think of the, the subvention that we hear a lot about, that's, it's, I think it's about 11 billion euros a year. It's okay. a disputed figure though, isn't it, David? Because it doesn't include things like paying for the House of Windsor, paying for Pershing missiles and so forth. Well, uh, I don't think uh, United Ireland would be paying for any Pershing missiles now. Or exactly. the House of Windsor. There's, there's we have a chance thing. to pay for the House of Windsor. We don't really have to pay for them. Who cares? Give them a few quid. I don't give a damn. Right? If that's the price, who gives a damn? Let them flounce around in their kilts and whatever, right? Now, but my point is, let's say the subvention is 11 billion. Okay, that's about 4% of Irish GDP at the moment, right? Less. We're spending 30 billion on bloody COVID at the bat of an eye. It's no big deal. It's not. The evidence of the two jurisdictions, in a way, Ireland has been an extraordinary economic laboratory. So you have two people on the one island. 
more or less the same people. I, it's, the, it's, what, it's, it's, what, it's what Freud would call the narcissism of small differences, okay? I remember bringing an Argentinian friend of myself up, at, up to Belfast recently, and I think you've met him, Martin Lestow, a friend of yeah. mine. Yeah. yeah. And he was looking at Falls Road and the Shankill, and we took him across Lower Newton North Road and la, la, la. And his view as an Argentinian was, you know, the differences when you actually take an altitude are quite small, right? And I thought it was a fair point to make. But if you, if you look at the country, if you look at our history, if you look at the economic opportunities, what you have is a laboratory, Martina, right? So Irish people in one jurisdiction do really badly. Irish people in the other jurisdiction do really well. What's the problem? The jurisdiction, not the people. I think about it. Like this is so obvious to me. It's so self-evident to me. Like if if you had if if economists could have run an economic experiment, partition would have been it. Okay? And they would have said, now, here's the same people. One crowd were rich, one crowd were poor. More or less the same people. Okay? Right? Differences of culture and religion, but in effect, more or less the same people. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take, we're gonna divide a little line. And we're going to have one jurisdiction and one way of doing things up here and one way of doing things down here. And let's see what happens. So for the first 25 years, it's like, oh, okay, it's more or less accords to the way we thought. The Northeast is still better off. The Southwest, kind of disastrous. But then over decades and decades and decades, you see this is, this is like, a, it's like an experiment. And we end up 100 years after partition with the evidence. And the evidence is overwhelming that the people in the northeast of the country under one jurisdiction have done profoundly worse economically than the people in the other jurisdiction. And you draw your conclusions. And the conclusions have to be that something to do with the jurisdiction, not with the people.